Okay, welcome back to the Chinese Medicine Integral Collective and to our December holiday season, um, heading into the depth of winter broadcast. And I'm going to say a little, create a little context, and then um, Will will introduce the topic tonight. So, what we're meeting in here is the co-creation of a discussion in the context of intersubjective consciousness. And intersubjective implies that our attention is on what is emergent between all of us. So this is different from a lot of discussions where each person talks about what they already know based on their own individual history and what they believe in and what their opinions are and what their goals are in it or what what they're and what we're each individually doing and this really is much more about a creative inquiry where we drop what we know and we sit in a very deep interest in finding out in our own experience together what is emergent what is so going somewhere new somewhere beyond the bounds of what each of us knew individually when we sat down to discuss the topic. And this is, as a conscious practice, a mirror image of meditation. So we could say that in meditation, we sit and we drop relationship to all content that arises. And we get in touch with a very deep and a very profound field, perhaps an, inter an infinite field of, of consciousness, of depth, of emptiness, of luminosity. And here we're striving and endeavoring to speak directly from experience, our own experience, with attention on that in a way that that same depth and that same luminosity emerges in relationship to each other, not in renouncing the world, but in a complete and absolute striving for an absolute engagement with it. And so there's the content of whatever we speak about tonight, which will be an emergent inquiry Mm, I remember when I first started writing, I wanted to figure out, I wanted to learn about the soul. So I figured I'll just get a bunch of books and read what the soul is, and someone will tell me what the soul is, and then I'll know. And by the time I had read about 12 different books, I realized it's just a discussion. It's just an inquiry over time, and it's an ongoing inquiry, and it will always be an inquiry. And so all of these discussions are really offered in the context of our own sincere inquiring into the topics that we choose to talk about, not in any way that we hope to come to some final conclusion, but to just offer the glimpse of the process of where we are, what's emergent, what is new. Um, in order to do this, we drop the past, we, we drop what we already know, we become much more interested in what's emerging than in what we already know. We endeavor to speak without abstraction, which means we tend to speak directly from our experience, we strive to speak from experience, and not about things, but as those things and from those things, directly as it emerges within us. And of course, the main ingredient here is a profound listening to that depth within ourselves and what's emerging in the creative space between us as each person's speaking. And we try to respond and try to build on that creatively. And I guess the conclusion here is that these are skills that seem 
critical for our time, given the complexities we face in the world. And people may notice that we live in a complex time with, with serious and engaging survival challenges. And that most of what we see in terms of discussions are people just taking positions about things and speaking from their histories and speaking from what they already know and speaking as if they know. And this is really an antidote to that concretized form of consciousness, which is offering an example in, develop, in developing the capacity to look into things with interest in, in a new and fresh way to see what emerges. And so with that as context, um, Will will introduce the topic for our integral dialogue this evening. Thank you, Lonnie. The notion of depth is affected by the gaze. Where does the gaze take place? In an eco-cycle social zone, that depth is taking place with respect to the ecologies of the interior and the exterior. Part of that exterior ecology is that of observing the way of heavens. May I ask a question quickly? Yes. Are we recording? Yes, we are. Okay, I'll just edit this out. You, you, you go again. I can't see that we're recording here. Usually there's a red light for me. Yeah, I've got it right here. Okay. No worries. No problem. Go Thank on. You. Ob ob observe the way of the heavens. Attend to the deeds of the heavens, and that's all, according to the Yellow Emperor's scripture of the hidden talisman. What is that hidden talisman? Where is it located? Where's the depth? Who, who engages the depth and how? And uh, so for the ecosystems of the interior and the exterior which envelop with each other that way of heaven becomes the interior and it expanded and deep place of the soul's movement in cosmos and in the world that process of understanding depth must take place in our world on the basis of time, space, or state. So that the location of heaven, wherever we conceive it to be um, in the, the watery place of the Milky Way, where as we come into this winter solstice and come into the, the, to the depths of winter as our solar system and our planet engages with, with that sacred feminine, um, that depth of the secret, sacred womb of yin um, out past the Milky Way uh, comes back into this place and, and arrives. And where does that depth arise from? It comes through, in a way, can come through, for some does, through, through the pole star and, and through the, the, the seven sisters, the Great Dipper, into a conscious expression here on this planet where then it's bound with earth as well. So then that eco-psychosocial context is uh, that also of psyche, our, our spiritual beings as they have been and as they will be, as they are. Similarly, for the social context of those spiritual beings with whom we come, become engaged in this life, those for whom we care, those who care for us. That level of consciousness becomes a, a, a penetrating insight of depth. That depth, as it becomes materialized, let's say in the Nanjing chapters one or five, where there's this implication of the five depths of tissues is no different than that of the five depths that take place in the open sky along the path of the sun, the yellow path. And 
we reach for a connection. We seek a connection. We seek a depth of connection. And through that depth of connection, an, a glimpse of hope, love, and enlightenment emerge as a salve for healing the, the deep, deep troubled souls that do come through this planet. And our capacity to hold that depth beyond its boundaries is the place where we have some possibility of a transformation. And that deepest pivot at the moment of the solstice, the winter solstice, that deepest pivot, whether you call it Taiyan or Shaoyan makes no difference to me, um, is the moment where the light actually begins to emerge from the darkness and the dark night of the soul. And we can have the possibilities of hope, enlightenment, and some form of full spiritual awakening. I'll give it back to you, Lon. <laughs> well, I think it's just out in the open then for all okay. the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, as long as you called on me, um, I was just struck while you were speaking. You know, in the poetic beauty of it, and also what came up was I just remember a woman coming to me in clinic. And we talked a little while and she was, she was married with a couple kids, but it was in a loveless marriage and we were talking for just a little while and she looked at me and was frustrated and her trying to communicate and she just has said i just want more depth and i looked at her and said well how much more depth do you want do you want a little depth or do you want access to all the depth and she was just stunned it took her breath away because she was met. And in considering, you know, in us talking about depth, instantly everything I know or think I know or have known about it, to really, to really speak from depth and as depth, it goes out the window and I find myself sort of with my toes over the edge of a precipice at, at, at just the limits, the limits of the known and looking into the unknown and interested. You know, in all the depth, not just a little more depth. I was just going to say that at this time of year, I'm quite a bit further south than most of you probably, but the, the, there's a sort of enveloping or a depth that, that's almost palpable just in the atmosphere, which allows me to connect in a sort of, in the silence to the web of life. And it's um, flow through me to maybe the client uh, and it's a to and fro sort of flow um, and Will was speaking about compassion and love and 
I see it in the flowering of a gardenia in my garden in winter. Uh, very odd time to flower, but I feel I feel something is trying. I feel that connection. Um, it it feels more palpable in winter because things are more stark and uh, the light is diminished. Yet my connection with the light is stronger at this time of year. Um, it allows me as a practitioner to bring in that depth into the treatment room. Um, I, I sort of feel the noiselessness of, of winter and um, this palpable energy. Um, this going inwards, yet accessing that which is out, outwards, outside. Hopefully some of this is making sense. Um, and a few things that were said earlier on, I, I so relate to, uh, it's just as if someone was almost reading my mind or had some experience of my day. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> that you're speaking of depth not at all in spatial terms but in terms of time and light and it's a true marker I believe of that integral as Gebser comments that diaphaneity of it and that it's one of the most astonishing things that this quality of depth is established as the movement of time and and attended to as time visible as light in the same way that Shen is ultimately unfathomable, but it emerges as Shen Ming. And then only do we understand its significance. I love, I love that you brought in diaphaneity, the, um, the ability to see through, the ability for light to shine through. <laughs> you know, brings up questions like, well, seeing through what, and therefore seeing what, and, and what's discovered when there's, when there's, uh, a leaning into seeing through the surface features into a more luminous within the withins of things. And it's interesting you were pointing out sort of the non-spatial dimension because it's like the withins of things can lead us to the fabric, which, I mean, the fabric of a shirt isn't deeper. It's the fabric of the shirt. <laughs> it's the whole thing, but then somehow requires a seeing through when we're talking about seeing through to the fabric of existence. <laughs> Thank you. 
so that made me think about the Hunan Po. And the Hun governs coming and going. The Po governs entering and exiting. Mm -hmm. And just that distinction of that binomial as they represent a kind of two poles of one phenomena. I think it's interesting to reflect on that as one being time expression, coming and going a question of time and exiting and entering more spatial, but that we can't have that interface of, and then to speak to the way that the interface between those spheres becomes enlivened so that even the body itself becomes in all of its darknesses still luminescent as a mystery and i'm i'm just of course baiting lori to speak <laughs> <laughs> or not <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, I'm it's probably obvious that I'm already deeply swimming here I started swimming as soon as you opened your mouth <laughs> well I was like oh my god you know, because we actually had an earlier conversation about um, in this text ring that I mentioned where we were deciding, should we take on depth? And, um, you know, that I was speaking to my own experience of the, that once you're here direction, there is no up or down or in or out that in this depth, you know, we enter um, a very different kind of spatial time orientation. And then, Will, when you spoke of like depth being the place beyond the Milky Way, it just kind of tipped me back into that, that that infinite upness is what we discover when we go down and in but then uh, then what happened was that we began to speak about time and i i love brant the distinction you're making there between the hun and their and that um coming and going as temporal and the po as you know exiting exit and entering as spatial and how we're moving into you know this place of diaphaneity where time and space are no longer really separate so then who came in for me in this conversation was the uh, spirit animal of the, the water of the kidneys, the, the two-headed deer of the will, of the je. And I, I got that that is the place where, of course, ultimately we enter into the depths is, is in, in that will, in that ultimate dark burial place of the seed and um and you know what i'm aware of because we're entering this season of of the kidneys and the water and the will and for me it's the season of the two-headed deer who looks in both directions who at the same time is this creature that can can be looking and in present, present to past and future as, as inter, intertwined, as connecting, as creating, co-creating each other. So that is so something about time and depth, like when you said, Alexander, 
what are we looking at when we when we say we're looking deeper than the surface and what came to me was we begin to see the story of the past and the future in that present moment of seeing another so that's what was percolating for me brand i was it was waiting for it to coalesce and you kind of put the little catalyst there for the coalescence anyway yeah it occur occurs to me that what you're saying lori that there's you know we're we're seeing through to to light we're seeing through to this this continuity stream that I guess you could say it enfolds and unfolds. It enfolds the past. That's that burial seed. And it, and it unfolds in an emergent arising. But it's not a stream that, that's on like a linear trajectory. It's a, it's a rolling, whirling dynamo that is sort of moving through ourselves and our clients as gestures of light mm -hmm. and it's a holizing agent it's like when we see through the world to, to a degree of depth we're made of the same stardust we're, we're made of the same the same movements the same primordial movements and so even as they sort of flourish um as tulips and daisies and porcupines and things like that there, there's sort of the diversity is is infused and shaped by that sort of light that's shining through. So it's like we're seeing through the world into this light, but 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 the light is shining through everything. It's seeing through all of us. Mm. That's good. I'm interested to explore where story and light coalesce and how story it's so often story is so often spoken of as a superficiality and not as depth, but then it has the depth. And to see that as a contiguous, a contiguous enfolding and unfolding, as you put it, it's beautiful. To see story emerging in that way as a, in 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 both directions simultaneously looking in both directions simultaneously what we've received and what joins with it and in that moment you know in a delusian way reconfigures it that it's just that 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 brush of light upon it is enough that wind blowing through the tree is enough to transform the direction of that sprouting growth mm -hmm. and how subtle how subtle it can be and how profoundly that can influence the material, the dense, through contact. And what does it mean to touch the story, to contact the story with depth? That's 
I want to, I'm going to just respond to that, Brant, because I love the distinction and the, the way that you're speaking to, you know, how we'll often say, oh, that's just the story, or, you know, it's just a story and we can dispense with that and just go. And, and yet, at the, when we are in this place of depth, which for me begins to touch on Lonnie, the question of what soul is as an ongoing inquiry, like soul for me brings us to that place of depth and included there is story as, as you say, Brent, as a continuous streaming through from ancestors past to ancestors future. Yeah. And of course, we can go deeper than that story, but in a way that river of the ancestors and their movement through time feels like a part of the depth that we work with, I think, I mean, I would say very much in my own practice, in my own encounter with, with the people that I work with, that I journey with, that I do alchemy with, you know, that that level matters. But I, but I love what you touched on that the story, it's how are we listening? Like to what depth are we listening? Yeah. <clears throat> The story lives at multiple levels, and the story lives on the surface, and the story lives deeper. And the deeper the story goes, the more the more fields there are that play into the stories, and the ancestors play in the deepest stories, and the whole cosmos comes into the deepest, deepest stories, and the you know, the Tai Chi pole that has the entirety of the universe in it, all the way from Bai Wei to Hui Yin. And again, that image of, of Du 20 at the Ren One birth canal, the deepest, deepest mystery, the deepest depth where we can't even talk about depth anymore because it doesn't exist. And that's what I'm feeling, that it, there's an experience of it where the depth is still a conceptual framework, but the experience of depth has no depth at all. As you all speak of the ancestors, I'm, I'm I'm reminded of technical matters, um, and and that of of the the depth, the deepest part of the deepest position, the left kidney, which is where I place my finger when people are giving me story about. It's related to ancestral phenomenon, and it, and in that position, I'm given wisdom and knowledge, which is another qualitative form of the depth, the wisdom and knowledge future that allows for a construction of formulas that has a relationship into the deepest of the ancestral stories that are unfolding for this individual. And that ancestral story is not <clears throat> limited to bloodline. You know, sometimes for the initiates, it's um, their spiritual um, lines, which may or may not be this planet. And, and the and then, then there are also, of course, those of us, I'm reminded of the, our privileges of, of having engagement with uh, uh, Dr. Hammer and, and receiving that from that font, font of wisdom and that depth. And that was such an extraordinary level of, of depth in 
the the work as as a process so it always still comes back to time space state for me the depth of the state of consciousness the, the state of the story what are the states emerging from that from those stories at a like a meta level so all of a sudden that which becomes meta to the discourse becomes a deepening in a sense because the the notion of depth and height and involute in that zone that you're talking about laurie where there's no up and down no in and out that's the whirling of the of taiyuan there at Lung nine where the where the all possibilities exist in all directions and no directions And that, that abyss is what's first mentioned in the five failings of physicians. That we're like, like Hmong in ignorant hexagram four people in the face of this abyss. And it's through the doing, it's through making it to that place where the depth doesn't exist is the only way to make contact with it. But to recognize it and to still go. Darker and darker still. There is a there is an allure, a call. It's just deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, I've, it's very similar to what I've experienced when I used to scuba dive, which is you go down and down and down and you're at 100 feet and you're not supposed to go deeper and you just feel a call and you know that it goes six more miles and you just, and then all of a sudden you hear a, a tapping and you look up and you're, dive masters 30 feet above you going like this and you're just realizing I would have gone forever so the air ran out and then gone forever and I'm aware sitting listening to everyone I'm aware of what's being said and and I hear what people are saying and I I guess this could be interpreted of what Brandt called story and I'm, I'm cognizing what's being said, but I'm just aware of my attention on, on a limitlessness with a call into it. And, and as I let go into that, I do feel an opening of the heart. I do feel a luminosity and feel the call of that beyond the furthest reaches of that luminosity where all the shadows just resolve into a darkness and i feel an allure in that to 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 let go of everything and not know absolutely And that feels like um, it, it feels like a deep, um, a deep letting go, a deep exhalation. But also, but as I let go more deeply into that, there is more corresponding light. Yeah, my experience is that depth has a a spatial dimension as long as you're not in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then once once you've fallen into it without going through anything particularly noticeable, then it's limitless. It's infinite. In every direction. In every direction without there <laughs> being a direction. 
<laughs> right. That's what I was going to say. It's like it's it's in every direction, although there's no discernible directionality. And and there's a a, a, a quality of, of light that even as it, ex, it appears to be fully revealed, there's like a mysterious magnetism to um, lean in more without a desire to see something more, but just that allure and magnetism for the sake of there's no finish of that sentence. And well, when you're speaking, Alexandra, what came to me is, and this is what we put the needle into. Mm. Hmm. Mm. It's like this, you know, the experience, I don't know if you've ever had like the Awatsu treatment where you're mm -hmm. taken through the water and, and you exhale. And so you hold this exhale as, as long as you can, and you're being moved through the depths of the water. And if you want to breathe, you, you tap the therapist and then they take you up and you inhale. And after you do this for a while, it becomes so pleasurable in the exhale that you don't ever want to breathe again. It's like, no, I just want to hold this exhale. I want to stay in the nothing. I don't ever want to breathe again. And kind of like a at the end of a silent retreat where I don't want to open my mouth and utter another word. I just want to stay in this depth dimension that's, yes, it's dimensionless, but there's something palpable and alive, like that, that statement, when the, when the darkness is at rest, then the light begins to move. This would be a moment to just invite the listeners to settle in with us in what we're giving words to so that we can be together in the stuff that is happening um, beneath the words. I do think it's so unusual to be met at this, to be met at a depth in this way and to be listened to from, to be listened to where the listening itself is an invitation to the source, all the way to the source. And my conclusion after 38 years, over the 38 years, and after 38 years of practice, is that it's really listening from here that's the foundation of everything, and that this depth, this depth is the context for a, a practice that embraces no inherent sense of limitation and and calls the patient 
to recognize that this depth is the is who and what they are and the ground of their own being and never to reject the story but but to really but to see that the story is integral with this depth and not separate from it in any way but to be able to see the story from the depth and um, that is what i found has been profoundly healing and i can feel that now between between all of us even though we're separated by two to three thousand miles right but but there's we are all together in the same place and and that is the recognition of um that is the recognition of the entire context of the medicine for me which is oneness having this experience of seeing the words come out of your mouth every one of them coming out of your mouth surrounded cocooned in a quality of emptiness emerging each word enunciating some birth of reality. With every moment, it's shocking, but so natural. And I'm just struck that it's even possible in this medium to experience that. Like when you're with when you're with a, a a patient or a client from here, it's like there's the there's you know it occurs to me there's this recognition that the client is already awake. The whole world is already home. That it, it sort of it di dissolves the myth of the return. Without with without trying to take away the the suffering that we all feel when we aren't in this place. But at the same time, from this place, there is there there's already um, there already an expression of awakened awareness. And that is, like Lonnie was pointing to, precisely what we're putting the needle. The needle is seeing through as, as a, uh, as an extensor of, of this radiance, the radiance within the practitioner making contact, seeing through to make contact with this radiance in the client in a way to shake hands with itself, to shake the rest of us into recognition that we're already here. There's sort of a vibrate, vibratory affirmation. The words, the deepest call, a soundless voice is 
presencing itself to me. Um, uh, the, the, the whole thing about stories was so present to me this afternoon. I can't imagine how it's just playing out right now in, in, in the way it is. Um, and the whole sp time space aspect of things um, and how our minds can latch on to something through time and space through words that have meanings for us as forms of communication I know I'm not making sense but I think I I'm, I, I felt very deeply touched by some words that I didn't even know at some point what they meant. This bird song, basically. Let's just leave it at that. It really deeply touched my soul in, in the last few days. Yeah, there's... I have a sense of, I think, you know, Will brought up knowledge and wisdom before. And I'm just impressed in this depth that there is a sense of omniscience, of all knowing, but it's of nothing in particular. There's no object in 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 the knowing but it's a consummate absolute knowing which then becomes a form of direct knowledge in the moment a presencing a direct knowledge that comes from the ability to be with not knowing to, to engage the unknown that creates a field of possibilities where there's an emergence of knowing tremendous clarity and um brant i was very much struck by the imminent power of your listening Talani, and the uh, the way that became reconstructed as a as a creative process as an enveloping words so this idea of dissolving the myth of the return though alexander is um i think it's a pretty compelling uh consideration to to dissolve the myth of a return it's potential for a book name i don't know I think it's called Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> Either that or the ever present origin, right? <laughs> I'm also just aware of a, a really deep confidence. I mean, from this place, anything can be considered, anything can be faced. Because, I mean, I don't know because, but there's the sense that nothing is moving here and that the view is vast and everything can be on the table and everything can be faced, everything can be looked at and and considered and um there's just a kind of strength that calls to for it might recall for instance um ladder 10 heavenly pillar the window of the sky the sense of just the uprightness and the fortitude and the strength and the depth and the wisdom to just be able to sit in the face of what is without turning and to be able to 
have the time and the space to embrace and see it all as it is. And just a deep confidence in that. Can you imagine what, what it would be like to um, have conversations between warring countries with this as the um, the mist at the heart of at the heart of the dialogue that level of confidence and absolute openness infinite flexibility but it, but but incredible uprightness You know, what kind of, like, what is this, a, like, this as tincture, you know, for, for, for addressing social complexity. I mean, just one drop of this, you know. Yeah. Realize that it's a failure of the imagination to think that what we have received will necessarily become what is. And it requires that in intercession, that intercession of the imaginal right. to fuel, to drive, to unfold the potential channeled through our imagining of the future we could embrace. But have to communicate, have to learn to communicate from within to manifest. That's what's very present for me, Brant, as we're here together, is that we are, that this, that we are collectively um, co-creating in, in this field, of course, exists way beyond us. It exists, it, it is, it is what is. And yet there's a, there's a way that the active engagement together in a process of bringing it and then uh, holding it together feels what came to me, Alexander, when you were speaking is that we are creating a medicine right now. You know, where this is a, this is an alchemical pharmacy here. And it's a, it's a tincture, as you said, Alexander, but it needs, it's, it is inviting it. There's a certain way that our cultivation and continued practice is the work required for the, what Gebser would say, the eruption of the integral. It's like the integral exists there, it's there, but to bring it whether it ultimately comes into this dimension of time or space on this planet, or again, whether it, it erupts in some other dimension, we're still part of that, like in this moment. My experience in what you just said, Lori, it, it felt like 
the world just got so much bigger. This sense of uh, a presence of being that has its intrinsic potency and that through the, the, the gathering, that, that, uh, that togethering as rich, that, that, that ritual of togethering, um, it, it, it like opens up a, the fabric into, into something that eliminates the fear of death. For if one was going to become anything, they would be coming this, in which case there's no way to finish that sentence. It's all, it's all, it's all good. And beyond all good, it's a potency that is amenable to uh, a garnering uh, directionality not quite directionality, a garnering, a, a, a catalyzing, um, a touching into and allowing it to um, become through. Um, not to change the world, not to not change the world either, but, but as, as, as a feature of its own, like pleasure of becoming. So, yeah. And it does, it does have the, perspiration of infinite goodness and healing and well-being for for all yeah that's what i'm really struck with there's such a sense of of deep deep love and like just being with you all it's it's like being with the gods and goddesses of all times, like right here in this moment, in every word that's shared. And this as the medicine, I I think of, you know, before needling, we must be rooted in like Schwan, <laughs> this. <laughs> And the sacredness, like my dog is snoring in the background and it's the most beautiful sound I can imagine. Like <laughs> right, because once this breaks through, it then breaks through, it erupts through everything. So the snoring, you know, the rattling of plates in the distance, the the grumbling, you know, bad day, whatever it is, it's... It, this is erupting, uh, and for our listeners, erupting in this way is spelled with an I. It's like something not erupting like a volcano, but erupting like um, uh, bursting into. Barreling through the snore. And it really is, Randine, I love how you spoke of Schwen, and it really is like the er erupting with the eye is exactly what you said, that, that when that darkness rests, out of it comes all this, all these threads of light. <laughs> That is the existence tissue. It's <laughs> mm. that we get to touch with the needle or the word or just a presence, this presence. Right. I was, for some reason, I had a quote and I don't know who said it. I can't remember coming to my mind about when you stare into the abyss. The abyss stares back. And that hit me and I thought, you know, this is what we're experiencing is beyond that too. 
it's beyond that duality of two things looking at each other. And I think we transcend the return because we realize in this moment, which is the only moment there ever has been or ever will be, that the return and the eruption are happening simultaneously. Absolutely. And this is, um, I mean, since this is a Chinese medicine thing, I think this is the character, you know, Chang as in Chang Chi, which, which, which means both the, which, which depicts both a whirlpool going, descending to the source as well as a geyser exploding from it simultaneously. And, and we can feel that. I mean, this is the Chang. This is the all things blended into one with the simultaneous return and eruption exploding together at the same time. And you can feel that in the heart and feel that in the mind. And all of a sudden, it's not some character with an etymology and it's not abstract. Right. It, it's literally where we all are together. And I, I, I come back, Brent, to what you said, that it is through our imagining into this together. Um, that, and again, how do we finish that sentence? But there is a way, at least for me, and we've kind of talked about this some in other gatherings, but that this is at this moment, which is the only moment, this is really the only activity, if you want to say, um, the only doing <laughs> that it feels really in integrity with the moment. Everything else just feels like <laughs> you're kind of flopping over into, <laughs> I guess, into more wonderful whatever. But, but being in that, in in this eruption, feels like certainly, at least for me, what I'm interested in doing right now. Kind of like all all the time, right? Like all the time. Well, the Bodhisattva vow tells us let no interaction be insignificant. <laughs> I mean, this this is this is the context for human relationship. This is the con who we are. This is why we're here. This is the foundation of 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 being and living. And, and from this vantage, a lot of the rest of it seems more superficial, which isn't to discount all of it, but relatively more superficial. I feel like right now I could, I, if I close my eyes, I'm meditating. And if I open my eyes, 
we're all here together, but there's no difference in the experience. Yeah, like there's no idea of this amorphous oneness. The, the, the distinction is so present as the all in every movement, every gesture, every voice. The distinctions are there as the carrier, as the expression nothing lacking yeah and that's amazing right because in, a, in the consideration of the greatest depth, we find the greatest fullness. Mm -hmm. and, and out of that comes gratitude. And I, I want to say, Randine, that I really appreciate your articulating that this isn't a state of fusional kind of blending or we're all losing ourselves in this depth that 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 what i'm really getting in real time is the possibility you know of that diaphaneity where the distinctions remain but not as separations but rather what i heard when you said that was that the distinctions become like this amazing Cor like cor chorus of vibration but the uniqueness of each one is not dissolved in these depths well, like the agency grows yeah it's enhanced the distinction yes. is enhanced because there's no there's no different separation, but the distinction is brighter, more poignant, more present, more here. And that's something, you know, that I've cognitively known, like, yes, yes. But this, in, when you spoke it, Randy, it was like so palpable. Yeah, it's like, it's like there's a unifying ink that that equally allows for autonomy as well as is the uh, the shape making light that would allow for like I guess you could say um, like enlightened conduct like like um, and entering the world, from a place of automatic compassion and care and interest. And it's somehow, it's like it, it allows for autonomy as it also holds the feature of absolute sameness because it's, it's the, it's the light within the, th the thing that then can then that can kind of move through the sort of creative differences of each person's you know becoming and that also comes through the shape and structure of the sounds that emerge from each of our voices in the, into the field of possibilities that we share. And uh, that's a tremendous creative zone of possibilities for the imaginal.
when I am aware, you know, that although we're not really speaking about Chinese medicine per se, I'm aware how all of us, if you go to depth, like that there is also, because we've all been infused with this primal early it's like ancestry as it you know that 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 this is part of the ancestry of this conversation just that we've all like really lived into this 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 amazing stream of of physicians who lived in this very place that we are co-creating here and then of course that we are spilling it over into our future ancestors who will practice as you speak that Lori, the um, one of our ancestors comes to mind Tian Shi. And the, the process of speaking, the process of just using the smallest amount to create the largest amount of difference. Mm. That that voice, while it's not ensconced necessarily in medical theories, it is the voice that emerges at the point of engagement with our clients and patients. Well, it feels like we're all together and that nothing more needs to be said. <laughs> really beautiful. Truly. Well, we, I think we'd all like to thank um, our listeners and the people who've been engaging with us through these dialogues. And I know I can speak on behalf of the collective when we wish um, you and yours a healthy, happy, safe, prosperous, and fulfilling new year and all good things in the future and in and, 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 and envisioning the creative potential of where we can go and who, who we all are together and who we can be together. And thank you for your engagement.